Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Frogs and toads eat bugs, lots of bugs. Today we're going to learn all about these beneficials. Also, songbirds are great to have around, but sometimes they are a nuisance. We're going to give some ideas on how to discourage them. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mary Smith. Mary is the Backyard Wildlife Curator at Lickerman Nature Center. And Mr. D is here. Good to be here. Thanks for joining us. Guess what we have on the table here, Mr. D? <laughs> we got some toady frogs, I think. We're going to talk about frogs yeah. and toads. And yeah. we're glad to have you, Mary. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be talking today about these beneficial amphibians. Okay. And I brought some of my friends some frogs and toads. And we're going to talk a little bit about why you want them in your garden. Okay, well, let's go ahead and pick up on that right now. Okay, right. so frogs and toads are misunderstood. So they are in the group of amphibians. And amphibians have a typical life cycle that's tied to water. All right. So all amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, are gonna start out as eggs laid in the water. And then they're gonna go through the tadpole stage until eventually <laughs> most of them come out of the water as adult frogs. Okay. So um, like I said, some of the stuff that they're misunderstood about is one of the things we get all the time is don't pick up a toad, you'll get warts, right? I remember that as a kid. Right yeah, here me now. too. Um, I handle toads, I don't have any warts on All my right. hands. Um, but that's a myth. Um, warts are caused by a virus, not okay. by frogs and toads. But what that myth comes from is toads are covered with bumps and warts, and that's actually one of the ways that they protect themselves. Oh. Um, so if, say, a raccoon or a curious dog is going up to a toad, um, they can actually secrete a toxin from those large glands right behind their eyes. And so that's one of the ways they protect themselves. Interesting. Okay. Now, what kind of frogs and toads do you have for us today, though? Okay. So a lot, basically everything can be called a frog. Okay. 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 Um, so, but they, they kind of start to break down into different families. And so I brought represent representatives of most of what we see in the Mid-South. Okay, so the typical frogs, like the bullfrog, leopard frog, those guys have long back legs and they leap. They're not hoppers like our true toads, have shorter, stubbier legs, lumpy and bumpy on their backs, <laughs> and they hop. And then I also brought a tree frog. Yeah, which, which is neat. Yeah, we were talking about tree frogs. A lot of people think they're a tropical species, but we do get tree frogs here in the Mid-South, and this is a representative of the green tree frog. And then lastly, I brought along a spade foot, which is one that a lot of people probably have in their gardens, but they don't see them because they stay buried in their substrate most of the time. Okay. Now let's explain it to the folks, especially gardeners. How are they beneficial though? Great, so uh, they're beneficial in a number of different ways. So the one that we think of and probably most gardeners appreciate is that they eat a lot of insects. Mm. Um, so bullfrogs, for example, will eat anything that moves, anything they can fit in their mouth. And so they're really beneficial that way. But frogs and toads can absorb things through their skin. Mm. So things like pollutants um, or they're uh, susceptible to different funguses. Mm. So they can be a big indicator that something might be going on in your yard okay. um, as far as maybe there's a, you're using a pesticide or something that's affecting the amphibian population. So they can be good environmental indicators okay. as well. Okay. And then of course, what I like about frogs and toads too, especially starting in the spring, is their sounds. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. so um, especially warm nights, that's when we'll start to hear things like the tree frogs, um, and then the bullfrogs have that call where they get their name. They sound kind of yeah. like the, the sound of a cow or a bull, uh -huh. and that's how they get their names. Uh -huh. um, and so springtime, it's a, a great chorus of frogs and toads. I'm sure. Mr. D, you probably hear some of those bullfrogs. I do hear some of those bullfrogs, and I've eaten some of those bullfrogs before. Too. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're very tasty. Oh, wow. How about that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So that's what we were talking about. If you've eaten frog legs, most yeah. of the time they come from an American bullfrog because it's one of the largest frogs, native frogs, that we get in North America. 
Okay, it's good to know. So how do we attract those frogs and toads in our gardens? Okay, so I have a couple tips on attracting mm -hmm. these. And the first one is, you know, we think about what kind of habitat are we providing. Okay. When we talk about their life cycle, they're all tied to water. So if you have some sort of water source or protecting our watersheds and our wetlands, those are definitely beneficial. Mm -hmm. Some other things you can do, um, I brought along here, almost um, all of our gardeners will have some sort of pot. Right. Maybe it's got a crack in it or um, it's not really useful anymore as a pot, you can make it into what we call a toad abode. And so <laughs> what you do right. is if you've got one of these uh, clay pots and a couple nice rocks, just kind of prop it up ah. and that gives a little respite for the toad to um, hide out during the heat of the spring and summertime. Okay. Um, if you have a pot and it has a nice hole right here, you, can, you don't even need the rocks, the toad can get in that way. Okay. How about that? So what do y'all feed the toads and frogs out at Lichterman Nature Center? So at Lichterman Nature Center, their diet is insects and uh, mainly crickets, mainly um, crickets and sometimes mealworms too. Um, the toads, which a lot of our kids get a, a big kick out of this, um, sometimes uh -huh. are pretty um, good at eating in front of people. So this is a, an American toad okay. and they're basically, they're looking for things that might be moving and what they use is those kind of bulging eyes, which is um, another characteristic of the toads, is they have kind of these big bulging eyes versus okay. the frogs. Um, but they're going to use those eyes. They go into their head and help push that food to the back of their mouth. Wow, how about that? Okay. Now, we talked a little earlier. You did mention that the bullfrogs will consume other frogs too though, right? That's right, oh. bullfrogs are really yeah. known to um, <laughs> eat anything they can fit in their mouth. So uh -huh. they'll eat other frogs, they'll definitely eat a uh -huh. lot of insects, and they're gonna eat things as large as birds, as long as they can fit them in their mouth and they're opportunist feeders, so whatever they can catch. Whatever they can catch, they yeah. Can, oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> Did you see just, his eyes closing? Yeah, I just saw that. Yeah. I think that is so neat. I'm sure the kids actually enjoy that, don't they? They do, yeah. Wow. Now, if you were a kid and you wanted to, you know, catch a frog or whatever, what, what's the best way to do that? So the best way to do that is to look for the right environment. Okay. So I find them sometimes in my garden um, around the house. So you're looking for the right sort of environment. They aren't going to be in a dry field. They need some sort of moisture. Okay. Um, and then just kind of listening for them. If you're hearing them, they're definitely around. And then you always want to let them go um, after you kind of observe them for a while and let them back in their environment so they can finish eating and, and potentially find a mate. Okay. Because that's what we want to do, right? Find a mate. Yeah. <laughs> so those are some of those calls that we hear, right? Some of those sounds. I mean, is that why they're making those sounds? Absolutely. Those sounds, most of the time they're trying to attract a mate. Sometimes it's territorial trying ah. to keep another male away. But most <laughs> of the time it's to attract a mate. All right. So there you go, Mr. D. Those are the sounds you're hearing out there. <laughs> this toad is extremely unhappy because he just saw his buddy eat a meal, and he sees these worms <laughs> he over here in this little canister, and he's trying to get to them. So yeah, let's see unhappy. if we can bring him out and give him okay. a yeah, give him one is... too. But they're what they're doing is they're looking for movement. So he's seeing those um, mealworms move around, okay. and that's what he's um, that's what he wants. How much can they eat though? Well, they'll eat quite a bit. Um, now we kind of don't want to overfeed them at the nature center, okay. but th they're opportunist feeders, just like the bullfrogs. So toads, um, they're going to eat maybe eight to 10 crickets every day oh, um, if you give them that many. Right. So, um, but they're really beneficial because they're not just eating crickets, well, they're eating goes. any of the insects. Okay. Another one bites the dust. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they get them pretty quick too. That's they are. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, Mary, we appreciate that. Yeah. We thank you for bringing the frogs and toads. Thanks yeah, keeping for us entertained. Yeah, they're entertaining <laughs> us. Yeah. How about that? So we thank you much. That. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about songbirds as pests. Yeah. That's kinda, they can be pests. Huh? And, and that's kind of, it's kind of bad that sometimes they're pests because we try to attract them. We have bird feeders and, and, and uh, but, but they can be a pest, especially when you are growing fruit mm. you, and blueberries, especially they will, they will completely 
wipe out your blueberry planting. Okay. Uh, so what I try to do is plant enough for me and the birds, <laughs> sure. and, and try to beat them to it. You right. know, I, I try to try to beat them to it. But but there are things that that will give you some relief. Uh, the 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 best thing and the only thing that I know of that is pretty much 100% effective is exclusion mm -hmm. using bird netting. If you have uh, small enough plants, two or three plants that you can put uh, you know, posts around and completely cover it with bird netting, mm -hmm. a real thin netting, then that will work. But uh, exclusion is the only thing that I know of that will completely work. And one thing you can't do, you can't kill them, you can't shoot them. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, you about know, that. You, yeah. uh, songbirds are mm -hmm. protected by They're law. Protected. Okay. So, you, you know, the 12 year old with a 20 gauge <laughs> shotgun, BB gun, forget it. You can't, it don't work. You can't uh, shoot songbirds. Uh, there are other birds that you can that are not classified as songbirds. Uh, some of the blackbirds, cowbirds uh, are considered pests and they're not considered songbirds even though they sing, you know. Oh. But, uh, but some, you know, you need to check local regulations uh, where that's concerned. But exclusion is by far the best way to, to keep them out if you can figure, if, if you don't have a very, very large planting, a very large planting, uh, then you need to go with, uh, there, you can use sounds, frightening devices. Mm. There are propane cannons that uh, you hook up to a propane tank and every yeah. so often it'll build up pressure and then it will make a loud noise, exploding noise. Owls, the, the, oh. the plastic owls, you can put them around. Mylar tape you can that flashes in the sunlight, you uh -huh. can hang that around in different places. Uh, anytime, with, with all of those, you, you have to change it from time to time. Yeah. A radio blaring, <laughs> uh, especially with country music, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll chase them, we'll, we'll do a pretty good music, job okay. chasing them off. <laughs> and you can switch channels, right. uh, but uh, you've got to, you know, put a radio in a, I, I have a radio <laughs> in a, uh, like an outdoor patio storage box okay. to keep it dry. And, and it's pretty effective. Mm -hmm. um, so, and because the voices change and, yeah, you know, you go from the DJ and, to the music right. and all that, and right. so it's, it's, it's not something that they, it lasts pretty good because it's not something they get, can get used to as easily. Yeah, plastic snakes. Uh, plastic snakes, mm -hmm. uh, any kind around. of predator. Right. Uh, uh, if you can find a plastic red-tailed hawk, Huh. Uh, that you can set up on a tree, and, but the but and then the owl, you know, move them around sure. because if they see it sitting there all the time, they go, "Hey, well, it's not going to bother me." But but uh, those are all uh, things that you, 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 to be successful, you've got to be persistent, and, and you've got to be use use a lot of different things, right. you know, uh, diverse, and 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 uh, and then. You know, you're going to have some damage. Be prepared to tolerate a little bit of damage. Now, what about when they start building nests? How do you go about dealing with them then? The the time, the only time that I see nests is a problem is is uh, if they stop up your gutters and things like that. Now, have uh, seen swallows? They build a mud nest up around yeah. your your light fixtures mm -hmm. in your garage and your carport. That's where the snakes really come in handy. If oh. where the nest is, close to where the nest is, if you will put a good life-like looking rubber snake, or a live snake for that <laughs> instance, you know, <laughs> up there, that will, uh, th I think that will they, will, they will, they will think twice about doing that again. And I've, I actually, uh, uh, have wrapped a snake around the light fixture oh. that the swallows kept building their nest in, and uh, they didn't, they didn't do that anymore. Of course, you. You have neighbors that, you know, folks, friends that come in, they almost have a heart attack when they look up there and see the snake up there. But uh, it keeps the birds out. Right. But uh, that's probably the best thing for for uh, for a nest. Wherever a nest, I mean, that's a st stationary location. You can put something there that scares the bird uh, that that should do the trick. Do they, uh, any structural damage that you know of that they may uh, woodpeckers, do or cause? Woodpeckers can create, can, can damage your... Uh, your, if you have a wooden uh, western cedar house or a mm -hmm. wooden house, they can get out there and they can they can peck holes in it. And most of the time, what they're doing is a mating ritual. Right. And uh, but but same thing, you know, uh, owl or, or uh, 
Something you can move around. Yeah, right? something, something right. makes some noise because they're relatively shy. Uh -huh. You know, uh, woodpeckers are, are shy, but uh, a radio or something like that can... can uh, you like that radio deal. I like the radio <laughs> deal. I've got to give... With uh, the country music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, uh, Dave Keaty gave me that idea when he was successful at keeping raccoons from eating his sweet corn with uh, a radio in his garden, then Dave, thank you for that idea because right. uh, I use it all the time. Oh so, yeah, I'm a, I guess yeah, I'm, a, I'm a music fan. <laughs> He's a music fan. Yeah. Before we wrap it up, Mary, is there anything that you, know, you want to add about songbirds or do you know much about them? Or? Sure, yeah, the only thing I would add is if you're gonna discourage the nesting, do it right when you first start seeing them nest before they start laying eggs, things like that. And it's just like Dee was saying about the um, against the law to kill the birds, you can't really remove those nests either once they have eggs and young in them. So um, get your fake predators out there early. So it has to be done early. Mm -hmm. yeah, if they are protected, yep. just remember right. that. So yeah, you can't shoot them, so we That's definitely right. want to. You know, bring that up again. All right. All right. We appreciate that information, Mr. D. Right. Good deal. Let's do a little bit of germination testing for some of our seeds. This packet was packed for five years ago, but we have some very straightforward and easy ways that we can test and see what the viability of these seed packets are. So I'm simply going to lay out a few seeds. 10 is nice because the mathematics are easy when we do some germination testing. So now we have 10 seeds simply laid out on a piece of paper towel. Then we'll fold it gently so they'll stay in place and then wet it down. You can slip this wettened packet into a small plastic bag. Leave it in a nice warm place. Cucumbers would like at least 70, 75, even up to 80 degrees for good germination. And then we can come back in a few days and test it. It's been a week. Let's come back and see what our germination test was on our cucumber seeds from 2013. We'll gently open the package and peel back our paper towel to be able to make a count. We have one, two, three seeds that haven't germinated. So that's about 70% germination, which would be what we'd expect from seeds that were a few years old. We're now free to plant the rest of that packet, seed just a little bit heavier than we normally would. And if we're careful, we might even be able to use these that are just germinated right here on this paper towel. All right, here's our Q&A session. Mary, you jump in there and help us out, all right? Okay. All right, here's our first via email. While I was digging in my garden, I found this pupa. I have a feeling it's not a good bug. Am I right? And this is from Mike from Ringo, Georgia. I can tell you this, though, Mr. Mike. You know what I think? That's definitely a pupa of a moth. Now, I don't know if that's from a cutworm or something else like that, but here's a good way to find out. I will put that pupa in a cup with some moist soil. See what comes out. Mm -hmm. Poke it a couple of holes a, in it, keep it that soil moist, and you'll find out what comes out yeah. later on in the spring. It, it, could could be a, it could be a beetle, too. Uh, it could be a beetle. It looks okay. similar to yeah. beetle people okay. as well. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. All right. So there you have it, Mr. Check Mike. It yeah, just, uh, yeah, do a little investigating. Mm -hmm. I would try that out. Just put it in a cup, some more soil, put some holes in it, see what comes out. Yeah. All right. So here's our next viewer email. Should I prune an old Osage orange? I just leave it alone. And this is from Elizabeth in Bahia, Mississippi. Look, look, look how he's looking, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Been, you you wouldn't prune it? It's been my experience. <laughs> leave, them, it? leave them alone. Leave them alone. <laughs> you know, they're, they're tough, tough plants. And Thorns. Bodark oh, is a, another name for yeah, the Osage yeah. orange. It's a very tough wood, iron wood. Uh, uh, you can make a fence post out of that plant right there. That's and what they last, used to use you know, last, back in the day, or my grandpa said, for barbed wire. Well, just about. Yeah. But, but 30 years, it'll last as long. It's one of the, the only, there's two or three wooden uh, black locust. Okay, okay. And the heart of a, of a cedar, the red cedar, and Osage orange will last 30 years. That's the life of a steel fence post. <laughs> <laughs> so prune it if it's the limbs are in your way. In the if way. If you're mowing under it and, yeah. you know, you can prune it. You're not going to hurt it. You're definitely not going to hurt it to prune it. 
because they are they are one tough plant. They, they are, are tough, tough trees. Yeah. And uh, you know I, you know they're really good if you want to like try to make you some hiking sticks and yeah. things like that. Uh, my old Boag teacher uh, had a paddle made oh my out of one, and <laughs> it's so extremely gosh. painful. I can oh tell my you. goodness. Uh, he was very proud. It's a pretty wood. I've seen duck calls made of, of Osage orange. The wood is kind of the orangey color. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with it. But um, as far as uh, a way to prune and train an Osage orange, yeah. I'm not aware of anything that out there. Anything, uh, disease, you? crossing, rubbing, I take those out and I'll leave the rest. You know. Yeah, because it is tough. It I know tough. I had a, I had a uh, when I moved down to Mobile in the mid '80s, somebody brought one of the fruit yeah. into my office and said, "What is this?" You know, I found this on the side of the road, and you know, I knew what yeah. Osage orange. Osage orange. Uh, they're very common down in the southern uh, mm -hmm. part of, uh, even southern part of Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. and, but they grow up in our up yeah, in the area, up in the mid well. south. I, yeah, I've seen them yeah, here. Hundred well. miles yeah. north of Memphis, we've mm -hmm. got them. Yeah. All right. So there you have Miss Elizabeth. Be careful. All right. Here's our next view email. My crepe myrtle has quarter sized white patches on the branches. Is this anything to worry about? I thought it may be because of all the rain we have had. I have thoughts about cutting the branches back to the knuckles. And this is from Terry. Terry, that'd be crepe murder. Yes, that'd murder. Be, I'm not sure that's legal. That's crepe murder. Cutting it back yeah. to the knuckles. Yeah. All right, crepe uh, murder. So, what do you think? The white patches? I Again, if we had a picture, we could definitely tell you white patches. Could be scale. Crepe myrtle bark scale, maybe? Because it actually, you know, you can see it in patches, you know, on some of those uh, branches and stems. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Because everything else, you know, of course, if it was black, we'd say black sooty mode, and that'd be because of aphids or the crepe myrtle bark scale. But I'm thinking that's what that is. Yeah. And I wouldn't cut, all, cut it off, you know, just uh, try to control the scale. And right. right now, what would you recommend? Is the, the uh, in metacloprid, of course. You know, you can put that in the ground late April, May, you know, into July. You know, so yeah. systemic, you know, roots to take it up. And, of course, that will help, you know, with the scales. Yeah. And a lot of people have been treating it because the pressure from the scales has pretty much gone down a little bit, yeah. you know, the past few years. Yeah. Because there are people treating, you right. know, for it. But, I mean, that's what I would do. But yeah. without having a picture, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Right. Yeah, yeah you so. got to send pictures. Right. Yeah. Pictures help. Right. Yeah, and cutting it back to the knuckles. I actually, you know, somebody actually told me this. If you cut them back to the knuckles and they have scales, maybe you eliminate some of the scales. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. But I just think that's a bad practice, though. Well, you know, I've seen research that's said that if you prune crepe myrtles very, very heavily, they'll have a lot of blooms on them. If you don't prune them at all, They'll have a lot of blooms on. Right. So, so there you have it. I tend to go on the don't prune them very much. Yeah, I don't prune mine at all. Them, at all. Know, they are a tree. Yeah. I like a crepe myrtle to be a tree, not a bush. Right. I'm and, with uh, you. you know. I'm yeah. with you. All right, so there you have it, Terry. All right, here's our next video email. About this time every year, I see wild onions popping up in my garden. Is this something I should deal with? And if so, what can I do? You know about those wild onions? It's probably... What? Wild garlic. Yeah, what that's telling me is you need to be planting onions in your garden. <laughs> yeah. This time, if wild onions, wild garlic is popping up, you need to you be need planting to plant. onions in your garden. <laughs> and and you know, and not, unfortunately, in a garden situation, it's gonna be uh, tough. I don't uh -huh. know of anything that you can put out there that won't hurt your garden vegetables. In a yard situation, there's a lot of things that right. you can use to take it out, take wild garlic out of uh, out of. Uh, uh, your your turf grass, but uh, in a garden situation, I'm not seeing that as a problem. You can cultivate it, dig them up, you know. Yeah, just dig them know, up. Mm -hmm. You know, the ground has been moist. Yeah, you know, and here and I would just uh, real you know, easy to dig. Get your trial and get your family plot trial. You, 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 you can't pull, pull them up, up, but you can dig them up. You can dig them up because yeah. they have bulbs, right? So you want to make sure you get all the bulb the bulblets. And it is they are it is this is wild garlic probably wild mm -hmm. garlic has it's the wild round, garlic. the round hollow. Stem and mm -hmm. the, if it's wild onion, doesn't it have a, like a flat? Yeah, it has a f flat, solid stem. Mm -hmm. Flat, solid. So there's stem. your difference. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Right. But if it if it's in your lawn, then how would you control it? In my lawn, I mean, I would I'd probably go in there early with with uh, 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 weed be gone. Weed be gone. It's a mixture of 240 yeah, dicamba, mecoprop, or you know different things like that, and that'll do the trick. It may take more than one treatment. Oh, it will. But 
over a period of time, you can take them out. Right. And, th and there are several, uh, I think, image. Image is, is another is one. Listed, Emasic one. You know, there yeah, are several, several herbicides that will yeah. take out wild garlic. Right. In, in, in your lawn, turf. In right. your lawn. Yeah, but so don't do, do it in uh, your yard. Do label yeah. on that. Because some of these things have some pre-emergent activity. If you, if you spray your garden, even though you're going to, you know, you don't have anything planted out there right now, some that pre-emergent activity can yeah. cause you problems yeah. with uh, your tomatoes and your That's peas good point. and your, you know, other things. Yeah, good point. But yeah, in a garden setting, yeah, I would just, yeah, get a trial, get it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't just spray anything get out in there my garden. And, yeah, use that tiller and yeah, cultivate it out. Cultivate it out. All right, so Mary and Mr. D, we're out of time. It's been fun. Thank you. All right, thank you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us. It's about time to put seeds in the ground and start this year's garden. If you have any gardening questions, go to familyplotgarden.com to get answers. We have hundreds of videos on all sorts of gardening topics. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.